open your eyes, Sokol, and remember to breathe, was the first thing that he heard when he found himself embodying a human. The voice was unfamiliar to him, but he knew it was that of his partner, Aurel. While he was regaining his consciousness from the depths of time, two other voices came through to him. One was clear and purposeful, the other not so much. Exorcisamos te, omnis immunde spiritus, omnis satanic potestas, omnis infernalis adversariae, omnis legio, omnis congregatio et secta diabolica, in nomine et virtute domini nostre Jesu Christi. The voice of the old friar reciting the rites of the exorcism was undercut by otherworldly shrieks that couldn't have possibly come from the body of the young girl lying on the single bed set in the middle of the room. Yet they were. Aurel, when? Sokol found the strength to ask his partner. 1614, Earth, she replied. Aurel was pretending to wipe Sokol's brow from the beads of sweat that had gathered there still out of breath from the run around the house until she found the right room. She seemed to have the misfortune of landing into a woman's body in an era when life wasn't very giving to the female gender. The housemaid had fallen asleep in the back room where the terrible, demonic voice couldn't reach, presenting an opening for the time agent to possess her body. Sokol, on the other hand, was hunched up in the corner of the little room, dressed as a friar. By this point in the exorcism, he was supposed to be on his feet, but his host had passed out from the strain of the experience, allowing Sokol free access to fully take over. I can't believe we managed to follow it so easily. Stop wasting time and send to your mind. It's unlikely we'll be getting another chance like this one, Aurel said, then grabbed Sokol with both hands, picking him up from the floor. How are you so acclimated? Aren't you even a little dizzy from the jump? Sokol asked her, then immediately started retching, thinking his host would pass out again. He wasn't as used to terrestrial bodies as Aurella was. The vile gases and sulfuric smell in the room that always followed the time jumpers when they would possess a mortal made it even worse for the younger of the two time agents. This friar is doing most of the work for us. Get ready, we need to expel its consciousness the very moment its connection to the host weakens. Aurel snapped at him again. I never understood why religious rites work so well to drive out the jumpers. Just be glad they do. Before Sokol could even process the simplicity of Aurel's response, another shriek, even louder and more awful than the previous ones, suddenly grabbed their attention. Sokol almost vomited from the smell that came out of the girl's mouth. Imperat tibi Deus Altissimus, qui in magna tua superbia tu simili aberi ad hoc presumis, qui omnes omnes vult salvos fieri et ad agnitonem veritatis venire. The friar pressed on with the right, resolute in every word he spoke. However, the time jumper that had taken hold of the body wasn't willing to sever its connection to it so easily. It's fighting back! Here! Aurella shoved a book in Sokol's hands. Recite with the friar! Still trembling from the jump, it took a moment before Sokol managed to find his legs to stand by himself, let alone the needed page in an ancient language he was learning on the go. Sokol stepped next to the old friar and looked at the possessed girl that now lay frozen on the bed as if she were dead. Small, inarticulate shrieks left her lips every so often, just to remind them that both she and the entity inside her body were still very much alive. Her hair was practically torn out and her nightdress was covered in waste and blood. She was clutching the covers with an unnatural grip. Her nail beds were bare and bloodied, Unable to look at her any longer, Sokol's glance traveled up along the wall behind the bed, where he saw the religious symbol that was also embroidered on his robes. There he found the girl's missing nails, pinned around the ornament. He could hear the old friar reciting more intensely, so he looked back down at the text and tried to catch up with his cadence. Eventually, Sokol spoke in unison with him, as if they had been doing the rite together countless times. Ergo, 
Drago maledicte et omnis legio diabolica. Adjuramus te per Deum vivum, per Deum verum, per Deum sanctum, per Deum qui sic dilexit mundum, ut filium suum unigenitum daret, ut omnis qui credit in eum non pereat, sed habeat vitam eternam. When both voices echoed the words of the rite simultaneously, the girl began twisting in abominable ways, and the sound of bones cracking made the old friar wretch as well. Her body lifted from the bed as if an unknown force had taken complete control over it. She was levitating a few centimeters off the soiled sheets, still twisting in inhuman poses. Her face was the embodiment of anguish. Cessa di cerpere, umanas creaturas, e isque eterne perditionis venenum propinare, desine ecclesiae nocere et eius libertati laqueros ingicere. The old friar was so focused on the right that he had forgotten to dismiss the maid, which was a potential hazard in an exorcism, since the possessor could jump into anyone. Jumping through time, on the other hand, wasn't his problem, it was theirs. As the rite went on, Sokol noticed that Orella was getting worried, pacing up and down the room. He knew what was on her mind. They were losing Phoenix. It was very close to jumping time again and escaping them in the maelstrom of history, doing unspeakable acts of time violation in the process. Sokol paused. Another pestering thought went through his head, something that had bothered him from the very moment they were assigned to the case. What was Phoenix's master plan? What else did it want to erase from the established history of the universe? No one could figure it out because no one had ever dealt with a time jumper quite as fierce and indecipherable as Phoenix. It was almost as if its only goal was chaos itself. Insanity, moreover, wasn't unheard of even among their ancient species. Trained time agents were known to succumb to it eventually as well. Time jumping could be very unkind to the minds of immortals like them. Sokol hadn't noticed that everything and everyone had suddenly gone quiet in the room. The old friar was looking at him with indescribable horror in his eyes. And Orella, she was angry because he had stopped reciting the words. In the few moments when Sokol pondered the intentions of their time offender, the power dynamic in the room had shifted completely. The girl was now a meter up in the air with her eyes fixed upon the friar that Sokol had possessed, fixed on him, seeing far behind the mortal and into the very soul of the time agent behind the flesh. She had a crooked smile on her face. Sokol looked down at his feet and noticed that he was levitating a few centimeters off the floor, too. Fra Claudio, the old friar murmured. Why did you stop? Read, fool! Orella was fuming. In nomine patris, et fili, et spiritus sancti. A freakish cackle sprang out of the girl's lips, interrupting Sokol. With the cackle still echoing in the room, the girl's body dropped back down on the bed. Sokol landed on the ground, and Orella immediately checked her for a pulse. The old friar had bowed to his knees, praying. The girl was dead. They had lost Phoenix. The next few seconds would be the most horrible experience that Friar Claudio, whose body had possessed, would ever have. Not even the countless exorcisms he would endure over the years could ever match it. The process of detaching one consciousness from the other from inside the host's body was taxing on both the possessor and the possessed. Their intertwined minds would be suddenly ripped into two pieces again, leaving the host with memories, passions, and thoughts they had never in their life experienced. Moreover, the memories weren't those of a human life. They were alien, ungodly, and unmentionable. The detaching was a form of self-exorcism that the time agents had to learn and master so they wouldn't hurt their hosts. On the flip side, time jumpers like Phoenix seemed to have a natural proclivity for performing the procedure. 
and to recover from it quickly. That ability made them so dangerous, and it was that ability that left no room for the possibility of the host surviving. Sokol had barely even gotten used to the human anatomy when he was forced by Orella to jump out of 1614 and back into the brutality of pure time, where their ship was waiting. There, they would regroup and commence their search for Phoenix anew. There's a message from Eternium already. Phoenix is still on Earth, Orella said after checking the comms panel for instructions from command. If you didn't like being hosted in a human body, wait until you see what's next, she taunted Sokol. But he wasn't biting. Something was still lingering in his thoughts from their encounter with Phoenix. Did it know? Sokol almost whispered. What? Did Phoenix know we were there? Orella stopped, turning in her chair and faced her partner. His genderless, featureless, synthetic body was scrunched up in the pilot's co-seat. Sokol was suffering to acclimate from the many time jumps they had done in a row hunting this particular offender. I think it saw me this time, Orella, he added. That can't be, Sokol. Her tone had softened. She sounded like a teacher, a nurturer. I know how seeing a time jumper in that state can be so dramatic and overwhelming that it can make you think all kinds of things. Phoenix is very powerful, true but I'd like to think that it's not invincible. It looked right at me. Stop it. Come on. You know better than that, partner. It was playing a game. A game we've seen many like it play before. Time jumpers love to mess with mortals. It was the friar Phoenix was staring at. Not you. Perhaps you're right, Sokol answered, but he wasn't convinced. I'm just acclimating. My, my emotions will settle, he said then hurried to change the subject. Is there any data from Eternium on our impact on 1614? Phoenix didn't change anything and left no traces in the time point, but you, you left a lot of thoughts in that friar's mind. Things that could have been prevented if you weren't so slow to acclimate. I would expect a reprimand from command when we get back, Orella replied with a touch of disappointment. Point taken, I'll be more careful. That was all I needed to hear. I've already activated the sequence to get us in its new time point. Get ready to jump in three, two... Orella's countdowns to jump were pointless, but she always did that to ease Sokol on a particularly difficult mission. The two of them had already left their synthetic bodies on the ship and were re-acclimating into other forms before she even started speaking. Remember to breathe. Sokol said to himself as he felt his new body submerging into dark and murky waters after a long inhale above the surface. The pressure was heavy on him, but he moved as sleek and as graceful as a feather floating in the air on a windless day. This is more like it. Sokol felt relieved because Orella had given him the impression that they would be possessing terrestrial mammals again he felt more at home and at ease in the water. It always reminded him of Eternium. Now, where is she, he thought. A deep and melodic roar vibrated through his body. And just a few seconds after that, Sokol saw the outline of a giant floating toward him through the water with the same grace he noticed in himself. There she is. Orella was speaking, but the tongue was not human. Long stretches of roars and wails and clicks made up a song full of meaning that his whale brain was now interpreting for him. She had told Sokol that they had jumped more than four million years before exorcisms were even established among humans as a practice. They were now in that wild era of earthly life that its later inhabitants would call prehistory. Both Sokol and Orella chuckled at the notion, but that light-hearted moment wouldn't last long. Suddenly, a third song vibrated through the heavy ocean waters. 
There was malice in its frequency that stirred Sokol's stomach. The fury of the incoming Colossus was preceded by an underwater wave so strong that it moved Orella and Sokol almost a kilometer back from where they were floating. The dark, ambiguous shape of an enormous whale was charging at them. It was Phoenix behind all the fierce power of the sea monster it had overtaken. On a second glance, the time jumper had looked at least twice or even three times than what Sokol felt his size was. He was possessing the body of a whale calf, Orella's calf. There was a thud, then darkness. And in the blink of an eye, Sokol found himself again in his synthetic body back on the ship, dizzy and shaking. That's the effect of a few hundred ton beast ramming into your head this time. Orella spoke, already hard at work on the panel in front of her. I couldn't let him kill another one so young, she added. The calf will recover as fast as you can acclimate. Huh? Fast? Sokol shot a glance at her. Is Phoenix still there? No, jumped back even further, but still in the water. You still don't believe me that it knows we're after it? He asked, and opened Phoenix's file on his panel. What exactly do you think you'll find there? Orella asked him without even looking at his panel to see what he was doing. She knew him too well. Sokol wanted proof that he was right, that it had happened before, that someone in Eternium knew more about Phoenix than he did. You won't find what you're looking for, Orella said after giving him a few moments to check the data on Phoenix's abilities. I've been through the file so many times, I know Phoenix's history better than my own. No one knows why or how it's able to do it. It's the first one to be ever able to see or feel time agents in the same time point. But you- I've suspected it for a while, I was just never fully convinced. Until now. Orella paused and entered a few commands on the panel, prepping the next jump. Then she turned and faced Sokol. I think that this ability is why no agent could apprehend him and bring him to Eternium to stand trial. It said that it had even killed hosts before agents could fully integrate their consciousness with them. Those are the agents that never returned to Eternium with a clear mind, the ones that can never again possess a body, not even a synthetic one. The Watchers? Yes. How old is Phoenix, Orella? Sokol asked when he couldn't find that information in the file. As old as time? <laughs> she chuckled. No one kn knows. Got it. Sokol was annoyed by the idea that even an eternal institution like Eternium, which dealt with time and history, couldn't find more information on a single time jumper. One more thing before we make the next jump. Do you have any idea what it wants? What it's trying to do? That's just the thing, Sokol. I don't think it wants anything, Orella replied, and pressed the blinking command. Jump in three. As soon as Sokol had plunged back into the water, now almost 20 million years earlier than previously, he saw the most horrifying thing he could ever imagine. The apex predator of the waters of the early Miocene epoch, Still unchallenged by the toothed whales that they had possessed in their previous jump, was chomping down the remains of an archaic dolphin. Orella! The megalodon was massive, brutal, and uglier than all of its later evolutionary cousins. Faster, too. It stirred its dark and evil eye towards Sokol as it crushed the last bone in the dolphin's body. However, before it could charge Sokol as well, Orella had pulled him back to the ship. I thought you were- Shut up! It's moving! Orella interrupted Sokol. Further back in time? Forward. You're going to hate this. Jump in three, two- Sokol met the ground of the year he jumped into with immediate vomit. His four limbs were shaking uncontrollably as he was retching and expelling the little food that his host had in its stomach. 
two million years before humans would even conceive of the religion that would bring them exorcisms and baptisms, other hominin races walked the earth. Sokol's consciousness had merged with one of those early and archaic peoples. Ah, not again, he thought and tried standing on two feet. It was almost doable, but he couldn't remain standing for long. The dizziness that had followed him for the last couple of jumps turned into complete vertigo, so helping himself out with his hands didn't feel that bad. He heard a few voices behind him, and out of the corner of his eye saw the silhouette of a female of the species approaching him. Orella, he tried calling out to her, but instead a growl came out of his new speaking apparatus. Damn it! The hardest jobs of all were the ones when the time agents would possess bodies with no clear speaking abilities and the hosts were lower on the intelligence scale. The woman had arrived next to him and quickly helped him stand up. She greeted him with a smile and offered him some water. Sohol felt safe in his assumption that this woman must have been Orella, so he took the small leather pouch. Suddenly, there was a ghastly and inarticulate yell behind him. That must be Phoenix, he thought, and gestured to the woman next to him. The hominin that had yelled out was running at full speed toward them, scaring everyone in the small group that was gathered just a few meters away. In a moment, all had scattered either on or among the tall trees, except for Sokol, Orella, and of course, Phoenix. The charging hominin tackled the woman and began smashing her head with some primitive tool made of rock. Sokol tried pulling him away, but there was no use. The hominin was stronger than him, and the time jumper was more acclimated to the body. Moreover, he kept pushing Sokol away without hurting him, using barely enough force to get him out of the way without inflicting some damage on him as well. The woman was fighting back. However, there was no fear or worry on her face to indicate she was struggling for her life. In fact, on closer inspection, Sokol noticed she had a crooked and eerie smile on her face that reminded him of the possessed girl. All of a sudden, it dawned on him. The woman on the ground was actually Phoenix, and her attacker had been Orella all along. Before he could stop his partner from killing the host with Phoenix, the time jumper was already gone, and the woman was dead without Orella striking the final blow. She looked up at him with what Sokol could only interpret as disappointment, and in a flash, they were back on their ship and in their synthetic bodies. What the hell was that blunder? Orella sighed. Shouldn't I be asking you that? She was furiously working on her panel, checking the messages from command and trying to locate Phoenix again on their time maps. You still tried to kill it? Sokol was angry. What was that going to achieve except getting us back here? 8752 AD. Jump in 3, 2, Orella! Both were back on Earth, in humanoid bodies. Though these were the exact opposite of the ones they had left more than two million years into the past. Orella, talk to me. I, I can tell something's wrong. Sokol immediately spoke. Partly because he needed answers from her and partly because he wanted to make sure that it really was his partner next to him. She was silent for a moment, thinking from what he could tell not only from her expression, but from the mechanical implants blinking on her face. I think I just made my last jump, Orella answered him quietly. She sounded frightened and weak. Don't ask me how I know. Phoenix has done something and i can feel it something has been off with my connection to the host bodies ever since we left 1614. that's why i kept bringing us back to the ship before we could try detaching its consciousness from the host body but you always acclimate so quickly the stress of this damned hunt is affecting you if you go back on the ship everything will be fine sokol had a touch of desperation in his tone he was bargaining with Orella over things neither of them had complete control over. I won't be going back to the ship. I can barely even feel this body. And this one still has organic tissue. As Orella said that, she staggered back a few steps and sat down heavily. 
They were standing high on a mining platform in the middle of what was once the Atlantic Ocean, and was now a desolate hell. Orella was looking down into the pit of the mine and Sokol at her. She tried moving her arms, which were fully replaced by robotic parts, but she could barely lift them a few centimeters off her thighs. You have to find Phoenix without me, Sokol. She added after a long pause. No way. I'm not leaving you here. Don't be dramatic. And listen to me. Orella interrupted. Orella interrupted what was about to become a heroic speech from her partner. Phoenix is here, but you mustn't look for it in this time point. It has possessed the body of a creature that you can't take down in a cyborg body. A creature that both of us would have trouble pinning down long enough to perform the detaching procedures. Why? What is it? It's best you don't worry about that now. I'm sure you'll get another chance to come back to this time point in human history to learn what happened here a few millennia ago and protect the moment of the apocalypse from those who wish to change it. Phoenix is not after that. Bringing us in this important time point is just one part of its game, she added, lastly. Sokol sat down next to her, realizing that this would be the last time that they would ever speak. Orella was losing her connection to the host's body and slowly deteriorating into a watcher. Never again would she be able to communicate with the material world or in any way interfere with it. Before Sokol could even figure out what he wanted to say to her, Orella was gone, becoming only a shadow out of time. The host whose body she possessed jumped out of her seat and was screaming at the top of her lungs. Not even cyborg minds can process the final moments in which a time agent would become a watcher. Sokol did nothing to stop her screaming and thrashing around from the panic that had overcome her completely. In a few moments, he too was gone, leaving his host to deal with the aftermath of his and Aurel's presence in their time point. There were well over a thousand messages from Command blinking on the comms panel when he got back to the ship. All of them were surely reprimands, but Sokol couldn't be bothered to check. He knew where Phoenix wanted him to go. Sokol lifted Orella's synthetic body from the pilot's seat and placed it carefully in the back of the ship. Then he took her seat and typed in the coordinates. 1614. Earth. Sokol opened his eyes and took a deep breath. The familiar sulfuric smell almost immediately made him wretch again. He quickly surveyed the room and found that the only two people present were the young girl and the old friar. The exorcism was well underway. However, there was no sign of Orella. Not that Sokol was expecting her to appear this time. The housemaid was safely sleeping on a makeshift bed in the back of the house, far away from all danger in that time point. He, on the other hand, was right in the middle of it, shaking and feeling even dizzier than ever before. His head felt light and airy, but he needed to get himself together as fast as he possibly could. If Phoenix knew Sokol was there, it would surely attack him soon. He didn't have much time to acclimate properly and had to act quickly. I have to center my mind. Come on, Fra Claudio, work with me here, Sokol thought, hoping that he was reaching his host on some level that wasn't going to break their connection. Once the shaking subsided a little, Sokol stood up, still wobbly on his feet. He took another look at the girl before moving any closer to the bed. She was frozen in horror clutching the disgusting bed covers. Pale as a ghost, with her eyes rolled back in her head, the girl was whimpering something in her own soft voice. Was she praying? 
had the old friar been more successful with Phoenix this time without their help. A little curious about what she was saying, Sokol took a few steps forward, past the old friar, and got closer to the girl so he could hear her better. Almost whispering, letting out a whimper after every few words, the girl was repeating the rite of the exorcism that the friar was reciting. Freighter! Sokol yelped. He couldn't understand what was going on. Was the exorcism successful? Phoenix gone already? That would surely make a big dent in his plans to catch him finally. More than a few seconds had passed and there was still no response from the friar that was standing behind him. He wasn't reciting anymore either, and even the girl had gone silent. The room somehow felt smaller than before. Freighter! Freighter! Sokol repeated, and turned around to look at the old friar. He was looking down at the book for a moment, then slammed it shut with both hands. The old friar shook his head, and slowly raised his gaze to face Sokol with a malicious grin on his mug. Quite unexpectedly, he extended his arms and grabbed Sokol's throat, squeezing it tightly. Perditisti, tempus agente, you lost, the friar said quietly, with a demonic tinge to his tone. Phoenix, Sokol barely spoke. In nomine patris, et fili, et spiritus sancti. No. No. The book with the words to the right slipped from Sokol's hand and landed with a thud on the ground. His entire body began to convulse, so he couldn't grab onto the friar's hands and push him away, no matter how hard he tried. The loss of control over his host had already started. Exorcisamos te, omnis infernalis adversariae. Phoenix's grip on Sokol's neck was getting tighter and tighter as it spoke the rite of exorcism by heart. During the struggle, the young girl sat up in the bed, gasping both for air and from disbelief at the sight in front of her eyes. The old friar who her mother brought into their house to save her was choking the younger priest to death with a crooked smile on his face, reciting the sacred words of her god. Sokol could do close to nothing. Phoenix had played him yet again. He was the one being exorcised from the body of Friar Claudio. How could Sokol have been so stupid and searched for Phoenix back in 1614 without giving it a second thought? Of course Phoenix could perform an exorcism on him. Phoenix must have been a time agent once as well. While Sokol was fighting with his own questions and trying hard not to allow Phoenix to sever his connection to the friar, he could hear Claudio scream in his head. The mortal was begging pleading and praying all at once. It wasn't a good sign. The connection was already dissipating, leaving Sokol without an anchor to linear time and the material world. In his final moments, before becoming a Watcher himself, Sokol realized that it was he and Orella that were being pursued, in fact. The Hunters had become the Hunted and their apex predator was Phoenix, uncontested. A creature with no sense of remorse, mercy, or understanding for both the mortal and immortal souls it tormented. A being that lacked any rhyme or reason in their action except keeping their own ceaseless boredom at bay. The ultimate trickster. Chaos itself. Hey, sci-fi horror fans. It's Thomas. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed the story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. 
Also, if you'd like to become an official member of our channel, you can do so by clicking on the join button. Memberships start at only $5. Until next time everyone, and remember, stay cosplay.